Hello, everyone. I think we have a um, majority of people joined already, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome again to the MBS Tarrant. MBSTRN um, National Monthly Pilot Study Calls. Um, just a few housekeeping items again. Um, you're able to mute or unmute yourself. If you are the presenter, please um, unmute yourself. If you're not presenting or if you don't have a question, please keep yourself on mute. But if you have a question, feel free to unmute. And just a reminder that this call is being recorded and will be posted on the NBS TRN YouTube channel after um, the meeting. Um, here's our standing agenda. Um, we welcome everybody. And um, if there's anybody that is new joining the monthly call, feel free to unmute yourself and introduce yourself at this time. Hi, Jennifer. Um, this Hello, is Mary Hi, uh, this is Mary Schultz with the Kira Um, We have a new member to the Kira Samay team, Alanda Williams. I just wanted to introduce herself briefly. Hi there, I'm Alanda Williams. Nice to meet you. I'm the manager of clinical care at Kira SMA. Thanks, Alanda. Welcome to the call. We're really happy to have you on the team. Thank you so much. Anybody else new to the call? Hi, I'm new to the call. Uh, my name is Hoda. I'm a senior medical uh, medical science liaison with X4 Pharma. Nice to meet you, Hoda. Welcome to the call. So, thank you. Hi, this is Jennifer Lewis. I'm the newborn DNA analysis manager for Texas Department of State Health Services, and I'm new. Welcome to the call, Jennifer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arlene. I am the genetic counseling intern for the IDPH. Hey, Jennifer, oh. this is Rachel Lee. I'm not really new, but I haven't joined for a while. <laughs> hey, I'm Rachel, I hope you're doing well. <laughs> I'm doing great, thank you. It's good to hear your voice. Oh, uh, same here. Anybody else um, new to the call today? or haven't joined in a while. Okay, so we'll um, continue on um, with the pilot study updates. Um, but before we do that, I just want to make an announcement that NBSTRN is having their um, annual network meeting in June. It will be June 14th through the 16th. It will be a virtual session this year. Um, so it'll be split um, because this virtual is going to be split in between three days. Um, there will be four sessions um, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll hear um, 30 minutes of presentations from speakers with followed by Q&A um, session. And there will be one presentation on um, an NBSTRN tool. So here's the link to register for the um, session. And I will also copy this and post it in the chat. So everybody um, can just click on the link and register. Uh, so now we will um, go on to our updates from our pilot study sites. We're going to start with um, New York. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day so far. This is Michelle. Um, so I have the updates on our various conditions. I'll start with, I guess I'll go in your order here, SMA. Um, so we have about 600,000 600, babies screened and 28 have been referred. Um, so that's just one additional referral from last month. Um, we have 16 babies with two SMN2 copies, eight babies with three, two babies with four, and two babies with five. Um, got it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, next is adrenal leukodystrophy, and we're still around uh, 1.7 million screens. We didn't get the exact number. 
we have 126 total referrals. 49 boys and 49 girls have ABCD1 variants. 126 referrals. 126? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the March number was a little out of date. A little too high. Uh, one eighty. Oh, okay. So that must that that number number must have just been off. Yeah, maybe or this one. <laughs> we'll, we'll oh wait, no, sorry, sorry. Ald one. Oh yeah, just one more. Ald. Yeah, okay, that makes that does make sense. Okay, phew. Um, and then forty nine boys and forty nine girls each had ABCD one variants. Um, what's next on your list, Pompeii? Still at about 1.5 million screened. Um, we have one additional referral. We have, I think, two babies that are pending DNA, so they may be on next month. Um, so we only have one additional carrier since the last call. 10 of those are infantile. We have 72 that reported as carriers. 72 carriers? 72, yeah. That's total, yeah. So just one since the last time. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, do you want all the breakdown or is that good enough for you? I think that's that's fine. If you want to um, report additional information, that's also fine. I can get it. Um, I usually go back and listen to the recording and then put fill in the notes. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, MPS one, we've screened about 600,000 babies. We've had 26 referrals and no severe MPS yet, <laughs> still. No MPS one. Yep. And the SMA was 600,000 too, right, Michelle? Uh, yeah, they're all, they started on the same day. So those numbers are the same. Got it. Um, and then Duchenne, we don't have an update for because we didn't have our quarterly meeting. Um, and then for GAMP deficiency. Oh, you guys started GAMP? We started GAMP around the same time as Pompeii and MPS1. We've screened 600,000. Again, same number. They're all started the same day. Referred 23 so far, and we have one true positive. That's it. You run, I'm running off the slide, so I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will um, fix these notes. And That's it. Thanks again, Michelle. Does anybody have any questions for um, New York? Michelle, can you remind us, was GAMP part of legislation, or are you guys doing a pilot, or? No, we just added it. It's not, it's not a pilot. We're, we've added it. Oh, just to so, your, like to your yeah. official panel. Yep. Cool. Yeah, we're excited. Are you using um, uh, the Perkin Elmer kid for GAMT? Are you? Um, no. Your in house method? Yep. Yeah, so that was. Those three all got added on October 1st, 2018. So when we added SMA and MPS1, we added GAMT. Ah, they come in threes. That's good to know. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't get used to it, right? <laughs> hey, Michelle, this is me. Um, if I do a very quick uh, calculation, your SMA, the birth incident rate is still winding like a 21,000? Yeah, I think so. it's okay. right around, it has stayed right about there, yeah. Yeah, so that your first publication seems uh, still kind of in a similar situation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering like sometimes a longer time, maybe things, uh, you know, very interesting. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and I know, Mary, if you want to comment further, I think you were looking at the across the board with all states and it was still a little bit higher than expected. If you look at all the states, is that correct? Yes, we're at uh, 
uh, with 27 states reporting to Kira Sime, uh, one in 14,000. But it's a huge range mm -hmm. from one in 5,000 for some states to one in 20,000 for others. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, is that variation associated with sample size? Or have you have you looked at it from, from Ryan, that Ryan, Ryan, you and I need to get together. I apologize. Oh, let's be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> you've, tr you've tried. I've just been preoccupied, but you are on my list today. Okay. No, um, that's a great question. And we need, you and I need to look at that. Cool. And, and, and one of the, one of the areas just for the, for the, everybody else's awareness, there was a paper that, out of the, uh, uh, a gentleman in, in uh, South Korea in Seoul that, that started looking at, uh, uh, publicly available genetic databases, um, for projecting, uh, incidents based on, um, on carrier frequencies. And I think what we can do with some of these diseases where we have uh, a more advanced direct measurement through newborn screening, um, we can validate that technique and unlock some really incredible learning for other diseases that don't have uh, so much newborn screening done yet. Yeah, if you have like a link to that paper, Ryan. You yeah, I'll throw, it in the, I'll throw it in the chat box here. In a that minute. would be great, thank you so much. Also, Mary, this is me. I, I think it will be interesting um, that you collect this data, also collect the SMI2 copy numbers data. Yes. And I think in New York, the experience is quite, uh, I, in my opinion, is quite striking and the good is uh, because newborn screening, indeed, you identify majority for New York data is uh, SMI2 yeah, two uh, copies. Copy. Uh, two copies, that's right. And uh, we thought uh, population screening will have, you know, much more, five copies. But uh, so far, New York have very few identified and, uh, you know, our program haven't, haven't identified any one with five copies. So I thought, I, if, I don't know if you agree, like uh, when the QSMA collect the data, not only, you know, the SMA case, but also each um, SMA two copy numbers category can be useful too. I think we are we are starting to ask for that. Um, okay. of states, so it's and and um, you know and it and it's really up to states to share that with us. Just know that when we ask you um, uh, for information, we it's all de-identified, um, but we're very interested in capturing multiple pieces of information, including, you know, number of babies screened, how many are positive, um, a confirmed diagnosis, uh, and then SMN2 copy number, and then treatment, if you know what that is. And we appreciate that. Not every state is able to share that data with us, but if you are, we so greatly appreciate that. Thank you, May. Okay. And we share it back. Okay, so when we ask you, we will share with you what we currently have. So if we have anything that's not correct, please um, tell us. We want, we want this to be accurate information. Thank you. Thanks, Mary, for your comments. Any, any other questions for the New York group? Okay. Did I miss something? Nope, I just said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll keep take that and move on. Um, North Carolina, you're up next. I know that um, the SMA pilot is ending. Um, so we are interested in still hearing from the early check team as well as if anybody from North Carolina is on the phone and wanna tell us um, if they've started their pilot, we would be interested to know that too. Hi, this is Kate. Um, Kate? So from looking at this, I think all your information is, is up to date. We ended the pilot uh, in March, so 14,003 uh, true positives. Uh, two started on, uh, were started on the Spinraza at first. At, you know, I'm just commenting on what Mary was asking. Uh, two were started on Spinraza and one on Zolgensma, but then one of the uh, babies that was originally on Spinraza qualified for Zolgensma just recently. Um, as well, and I think everything else is the same. 
I'm sorry. Could you say again, how many babies did you screen? So we screened about 14,000. We had uh, four screen positives. One of them was uh, false. And then three were true positives. Positive. Two of those were started on uh, Spinraza. Mm -hmm. And one was uh, started on Zol Zolgensma. Um, and one is... So and then one of the Spinraza switched to what was qualified for Zolgensma at eight months of age. And do you know copy numbers? Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, the one that switched <laughs> had two SMN2. Okay. And the other two had three copies. Great. Thank you. Which I think we already have there, right? Um, oh yeah, I yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're probably not gonna see any changes. This this is probably the final uh, tally. I'm not sure and, if you know, Kate. If you want to comment, go for it. Uh, but if um, you feel comfortable with the state person, yes. Screening. I I don't know if there is anyone from the state, but uh, uh, the state started screening for SMA as of uh, May first. May first. Yes. And did you, um, do you know if they're going back to April or? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. And, and that's what Dr. Schoen advised me as well, is they're not, they're starting May 1st, they're not going back. Right. Okay. Um, would you like to give us an update on um, Duchenne as well? Yes. Uh, so we're at about three and a half thousand for CKMM screening. Um, we have 24 screen positives. And I think, uh, let's see, 16 of those have a complete um, sequencing panel. Um, we have still the three that had a positive finding on the sequencing panel, one in the DMD gene, one in CLCN1, and then there's a one carrier of a mutation in uh, LAMA2. I'll get that on the rewrite. No, uh, no, there's one DMD. One DMD, three positive. Three total, right? yeah, three. Um, positive finding on the sequencing panel. So one of those is in the DMD gene, one is in CLCN1, and then the third one is a carrier of a pathogenic variant in uh, LAMA2. May I ask a couple of questions? Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, this is me. The with the CLSC um, one case, I, I assume it's not uh, X-linked disorders. Uh, I wish I Sorry, knew from I, the I, top I, of my head. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, well, the reason is because Duchenne is X-linked. So for CLSC one, right. if you truly you know the case. Uh, if not X-linked, that you must have a two um, disease cause of variance. Beth, Beth is on the call. She can answer that. I am. Um, so this is um, uh, expected to be an autosomal dominant. Oh, um, dominant. Okay, that's okay. Okay, thank you. And um, also, I want to ask, uh, um, what's your uh, M, uh, CKMM the cutoff of value? It's 1626. 1626. 1,000. Okay, so that's uh, what is it's a uh, compare to population data. What's the percentile? It is. It's a ninety nine point fifth percentile. Okay, thank you. And just so you know, um, May, um, which I think is kind of important for DMD. So you guys are. Do you guys? Well, it is actually a good question. Do you guys have two cutoffs because? For early checks, some of the samples are screened, I'm assuming a couple weeks after it's been collected, correct? 
Uh, that, that's right. So we uh, did our provisional cutoff based on um, specimens that fit within the kit specifications, which uh, are specimens up to 20 days old. Um, and so we have a single provisional cutoff and we are evaluating the stability of the specimens that we're getting in to see whether we need to uh, have a separate cutoff for older specimens. So we currently have just one. Um, but well, um, we also have a, a, you know, first pass cutoff that's lower than our actual just to retest specimens that are anywhere near uh, the actual cutoff. So, but that, that's a different situation. And just for context, Kate, I don't, if you don't have this, I totally understand. But do you know approximately the average um, time period after, um, you can say either after collection or after it's been received in the lab that it's, it's being tested through early check? Uh, so you mean the time like after old birth the when, we, when we're testing? I'm, I'm asking, my question is basically how old are the specimens after, uh, how old are the specimens when you're testing it through early check? So most of them are less than 20 days old. Um, okay. But there, there is a considerable number that we need to uh, uh, worry about that are older than that. Got it. Yeah, I think, okay, I think if this is a, um, one um, Duchenne case from like a 3,500 um, screening, right? Right. Yeah, so did you know how many boys, girls in this 3,500? The, the split is about even. Um, okay. This is, um, you know, just remembering from our SMA publication or when, it, when we were doing the data analysis, it's at the same pool. We had just a little bit fewer girls than boys, but uh, close to an even split. Thank you. And one more question for me. Too. Sure. <laughs> um, I know you guys, when you guys get a screen positive, I think during the, I think December meeting, you talked about your protocol where they would get the sequencing panel and the total um, CK from from urine, I believe, or something. That's right. This is so. Yeah. Do you, do you have it. do you have any um, infants that have a high total CK but no sequencing? With no sequencing, or they don't have any positive results from the panel? Yes. Yeah. So for these three um, positives, I'll just give you the full information. The three positives, um, unfortunately, the one DMD baby, that mother declined the repeat heel stick for total CK. The um, other two had total CKs that were normal. And then we have another baby that had normal sequencing, but had an elevated um, CK, uh, total CK at one month. And so we're gonna be seeing that baby in the, um, clinically um, at a clinical research visit at six months. Thanks, Beth. Sure. Is there any other questions for the North Carolina group? All righty. Um, thanks again. And we'll go ahead and move on to um, the Georgia group, which had a lot of exciting updates last month. I don't know if we're that exciting now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia's always exciting. Always we're always exciting. Going on in Georgia. <laughs> I don't know if I'm always prepared to be exciting, but, <laughs> but we are always exciting, right? Um, so uh, I'll be honest, um, I was just kind of trying to throw some numbers together last minute for y'all. So what I did is I looked, it was easiest to, for me to do it quickly to just look at 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so since January 1, I can tell you we've screened 47489 samples 
And this is for for since January one for every this is how many samples we've screened. Oh, for Total. everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just across the board, because I don't have number of kids. I have number of samples. Okay, and then what was that? Can you just repeat that one more? Time? Sure, sure. Four seven four eight nine. Okay. Yeah, that many samples have been tested. Um, so some of those are certainly going to be duplicate kids, um, so fewer kids. So since January 1, we've had eight on ALD. Sorry, I should start with that. ALD, we've had eight positive screens, and we've had one diagnosed case. And so I've probably, I, I don't know if I've told you about that kid or not. It was in January, so you've probably heard about him. Um, we also have one kid that we've resolved as normal of those eight. Two kids have been referred to clinic, so they, that means they had abnormal very long chain fatty acids, and they both have DNA testing pending. And then we have four kids who um, we are trying to get very long chain fatty acids on. So that's where we're at with that. We've, we've found quite a lot of ALD <laughs> cases. It's really stunning, and we've Got to have a, a meeting to figure out how to handle all these cases. Yeah, isn't it weird? Like, it's just crawling out of the woodwork now. But I can't remember exactly how many we've we've gotten us since we started. And well, and it looks like before that we had five, yeah, yeah, five, five or six ALD cases. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, no new Zellweger since the start of the year. So. Uh, let's see, that's ALD. Um, SMA, we, um, we don't get, we haven't been getting false positives for that as long as it's a good sample. And we've diagnosed three cases since January 1. Uh, two of the kids had um, three SMN2 copies and one of the kids had two copies. And they are all, I believe, in line for Zolgensma. Either they've gotten it or they're getting it, going to get it. Um, MPS1 in Pompeii, we're still look, we're looking into May, beginning of June. End of May? Yeah, or hopefully we're, we're angling end of May. Cross your fingers for us. Okay, cross them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our PUCD pilot is plugging along. We should be doing that until the end of September. Um, Trisha Hall's been putting a bunch of data into the clear tool. So I would say our um, false positive rate is getting better on that. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily where we want it to be, but it is improving. But we have not diagnosed anybody with that yet. So no screen positives. Okay. No. Know, know. They've yeah. gotten the same amount to as your beginning 47,000. Yeah, yeah, like we're, yeah, nobody's being, like, nobody's not being screened for any of these diseases. All our pilot kids, all, uh, all of our screens that come through go through the pilots as well. Um, Angela, can you talk a little bit about false positives and, like, how that's defined for that disorder? For us, for PCD, so, um, you know, we we're kind of casting a wide net on this just because I feel like I think we all feel like PCD is sort of the great unknown. Um, we take all of our screen results and we plug them through a clear tool that Trisha made for us to work with our data in the um, in that system. Um, she also got a bunch of diagnosed cases like from California so that she could plug those in as a reference since we switched to Neobase 2 at some point we really needed um, to beef up the game over it clear for, for us to be able to make use of it. Um, so everybody goes through the clear tool and um, one of the single condition tools and anybody with a score of three or four. So the two highest risk categories, if you kind of look at their risk categories, they have them divided into four. So anybody in the two higher range results, we follow up on those kids one way or another. We do also use a dual scatter plot tool to help refine those. Um, but um, but yeah, basically everybody's getting something if they have one of those higher risk scores, whether it's some of them are getting repeat screens, some of them are getting uh, plasma amino acids, urinerotic acid, and you know an immediate ammonia level. Um, but as long as they either get normal testing or a normal repeat screen, then we close that out as a false positive. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm, of course. Yeah, Angela, this is May. I have a question for you. Forgive me because I don't think I met uh, this call last time. So um, maybe um, it's why I need to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> what, are, what are the markers you use for the uh, PUCD? Just the clear results. We're not using any specific markers. Obviously, you know, it looks oh, a lot. Oh, I see. So you yeah. put in, but the, the behind scene, okay. I was wondering what kind of, okay. So yeah. what is the testing? Did you have a, a, a erotic assets in? The right, test? we're doing. We're asking folks to get um, a stat ammonia and then erotic acid and plasma amino acids. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is and, this is Tricia. Um, for the clear tool, it's primarily driven by citrulline, and then the concentrate, and then the ratios between citrulline glutamine, citrulline glutamic acid and then um, citrulline phenylalanine. Thank you. Okay. And Trisha. Yep. You, um, so I, I just reading my notes from last time, it sounded like you guys waited for the Neobase 2 kit to come out for, the, for this testing method. Is that correct? Well, we well, started with Neobase really Neo 1 and that was, that was not good. And, and so we put it on hold when COVID hit like heck and uh, waited until then Neo Base, we converted to Neo Base 2 and uh, discovered, as Trisha could tell you, what the problem was with, with that, given that lysine and glutamine run in, at the same place. And so we had to have some known positives to enter into clear in order to be able to do this. And uh, that's what took some time. And, and then, you know, we had to wait for COVID to settle down a little bit. And then we got going again. And it's been very active management, I have to say. Um, in, in, you know, we've been meeting nearly weekly to review what's going on and um, trying to make some adjustments with the new cases as we get cases resolved as false positives, because it's just too damn many. Yeah, not easy to busy. get. <laughs> not easy to get ammonias on kids. Yeah, I would say that's kind of one of the I, the nice part about pilots is is good opportunity to learn lessons. And you know, hospitals don't always have great reference ranges for babies or kids in general, but certainly not babies. And so we have had to learn how to mitigate a lot of panic around elevated ammonias that aren't really elevated for babies. Oh, did you guys say, did you say, Bill, it's hard to get ammonias or what do you mean? Yeah, it is. It is. So it's, it's hard to get a good ammonia because they got to draw the specimen right. It's got to be run right away. Uh, they got to put it in the right tubes. So there's only certain places that can do that. They just can't just go to the doctor's office and, and get a blood drawn. They can't go to a lab corp and have it sent out. You'll get something that's disastrous. So it's got to be done at a place that can run ammonia right away and can draw the kids. So it's a much more limited thing. And then they get back an, an answer from the laboratory that has adult ranges on it. Thank and, you. They, and they go nuts. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll be doing that pilot through through September um, and then wrap it up. So unfortunately, I don't think we're really going to have it um, be ready to present at the APHL meeting, but um, but we'll keep you all updated. Yeah, it would be interesting, um, Angela or Tricia or um, Bill, if we could have like a preview maybe <laughs> for one of these calls, like some of the lessons that you learned. Um, yeah, I think we'll, I think we'll know when we get done. Um, yeah, yeah. Once you're done, mm -hmm. if if this if this is doable or if it's just a you know not possible with Neobase two. So I might be reaching out to you towards the end of the year, see if you could give us sure. a little more of a detailed update. Sure. And home assistant area, we're still just kind of working on preliminary stuff. Still, um, we're getting some spots in from some states. Thank you, New York, South Carolina, um, and. Um, that way we can beef up the clear tool on that end. And we'll, we're hoping to get that more in gear at, once we get MPS1 and Pompeii up and running. We just kind of need to get that 
going first, and then we'll do a little more focus in getting this in actual live production. Yeah, you guys have been really busy. Yeah. <laughs> pilot, pilot work, but with all these kids that you guys are following. So it's going to be interesting. <laughs> and, then, and then we just got a new, R, new uh, R, RFA from the NIH, yes, which we're looking at. Yeah, I have an announcement. At the end. <laughs> that it's, out, so, it's, yeah. it's got a surprise in it. We thought it was just the IDIQ. Oh, okay. There's a surprise. I don't know about the surprise. Yeah, we can talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for the Georgia team? More questions. Thanks again, guys, for this, this, this update. This is very helpful. Very good information. I'm going to move on to Wisconsin. And I know May is already on the phone. Yep. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, Georgia is much, much exciting. And, uh, <laughs> you're all exciting, May. You're very exciting, too. <laughs> well, um, I, I think for now, uh, yeah, um, let me start with the updates on the SMA screening. And Wisconsin starts uh, uh, October 2019. So actually, I try to do the monthly. So I don't have a May data yet, but uh, um, I, um, up to um, April 14th, it's 18 months, we screening the 85,685 babies. So Wisconsin is much smaller than New York and uh, Georgia. And in this 85,685 babies, so we identified eight SMA, SMA babies. We referred this eight and uh, confirmed this eight. Uh, their SMA2 copy numbers are two case, I mean, three cases with uh, two copies and uh, three cases with uh, three copies and two cases with four copies. And the seven kids received those enzymes and the one kiddo uh, on Spinraza, the reason is uh, uh, this baby has had high uh, AV9, um, the antibody types. And at some point they want to recheck and hopefully can switch to the um, those enzymes. So that's uh, for um, for that uh, our incident rate is still in this one in eleven thousand range because I know since uh, uh, April, uh, April 14th we don't have a new case so I'm pretty comfortable to say it's one in eleven thousand up to now so the SMA and uh, we started talking about. Uh, uh, well, our state have our own nomination process for XLD, so still in the work. And uh, our Pompeii, uh, we finished the pilot and uh, um, uh, still waiting for the rulemaking to put Pompeii in the regular newborn screening panel. That's all I have. So I, I think it would be nice um, if we have some time and talk a little bit about uh, IDIQ, the new RFA. I mean, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, I just, um, we can discuss it. I just pulled some stuff from the uh, the RFP um, general language about here. Um, I, I see that some people from NICC are on the call. I'm not sure if they can comment on it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you can, or if you, if there's going to be a, a a, a webinar, technical webinar that um, you guys can tell us about. We, we, we would love to hear about that. You want to jump to that slide, Jennifer, just as long Sure. As we respond to the audience, right? <laughs> yes. So I'll put, for anybody that's interested, I'll put the link in um, betasams.gov in the chat box. Um, so if you have not seen it or the RFP already, you can get it on this website. But it's the NICHD RFP for newborn screening pilots. It's through the indefinite deliverable, indefinite quantity contract, which it's um, states in the awards is about six years. 
Um, and the purpose of this is um, to support development of evidence bases based for new conditions to be added to the RESP. And they talk in this um, announcement about conditions that are high potential to be nominated to the RESP or those recently nominated or in some cases recently approved. Um, so it seems like those are the pilots. And um, once you get the IDIQ contract, you're put into a pool where you can re-compete re for what they call these task orders um, to do a high throughput newborn screening pilot for many newborns. So it says at least 100,000 in a two year period. Um, it does mention in this that um, this the intent is to work with other the federal agencies and other collaborators such as MBSCRN. Um, we during these monthly calls we have the IDIQ pilot sites report out um, their pilot information, their progress on the pilots on these calls. Um, but and we also have the LPDR that is available for data to be entered into that as well. So I'm not sure someone else has, oh, go ahead. No, I just wanna comment. So I think you did a very nice job of summary because it's a long RFP. I read through a little bit. Um, the one thing I, I think interesting because I mentioned that I'm surprised, I, I'm just curious what's the surprise because we, um, because we are not in this uh, for the first round. A second, uh, I want to, if anybody else uh, review the, have the same impression, my impression is uh, for this RFP, you have to respond for the general ones. And also you have to put a proposal for the SMA, I mean, I said it wrong, um, MS, uh, MPS2, is that a correct? If you not ready for M MPS2, which is you may not be qualified to um, to apply. Am I right? Anybody else have that different impression? Yeah, we had that imp impression too, that uh, one is required to apply for both. But... Yeah, okay. That's what I, yeah, okay, thank you. So Bill, we're all at, waiting for the surprise. <laughs> right. The, the MPS2 was a surprise. Oh, <laughs> There's a task God. order okay. embedded in this, and it's like, okay, IDIQ, you know, hopefully it's going to be very similar to the last one we did and it won't be that hard to do, but a task order is a big deal um, and requires going through our state committee and a lot more, more uh, scientific and budgetary planning, and the deadline's very short. So and yeah, yeah I, the deadline is in can, June, correct? Yeah, June that's nothing something? we get. That's that's absolutely nothing we can we can accomplish in that time frame. Um, the, de the deadline yes, is in June, right? June seventeenth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. IDIQ, I think we can do without a problem. It's the it's a task order that's going to be a, a big issue. Yep, I feel the same way, Bill. It's why I feel like if we put that because I I don't know uh, which state. I don't know, Michelle, maybe you can comment. Uh, is it ready to do the uh, pilot for um, MS, I mean, <laughs> MPS2? Well, I think if, you're, if you've got mass spec set up for um, doing your other LSDs, adding one in, I mean, we haven't gone into the details of, of how exactly to do it, but I think that's a, potentially a straightforward thing to do and then use a, um, you know, we could use uh, perhaps a second tier screen in there. Uh, okay. If there's gonna be very many false positives, we really don't know. Um, this is Tricia. Uh, the only caveat to that would be by adding it in, you're turning your FDA cleared kit it, into an LDT. So you'd have to revalidate or redocument. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the only problem I, with adding into an FDA uh, cleared asset. The other, the other thing is if you have a bunch of other reagents, now you're looking at, you know, are you going to try to combine it or how you're going to, you know, do this? Like we're in the situation where we have lots of threeplex, but no, say, fourplex. So it would be a tricky thing. 
And I think beside this, I think, Bill, you mentioned earlier, it's within this uh, a month also time frame. And uh, we, as a lab, you cannot make commitment until you get all the things uh, cleared, right? With everybody. I'm not so right, sure. That right, well, we're not, we, we can't make, you know, we can say, even if even if Trisha in the in the laboratory and and us in the at Emory for the follow up program can can say yeah we can do this we still have to get permission from the state uh, newborn screening committee to uh, to do another pilot and you know they they've been pretty nice but it's a it's a formality you cannot ignore. Can um, I um I'm sorry to cut off uh, I just want to clarify for the other folks. In the on the phone call, that there might be some confusion about the IDIQ and the MPS2 task order. Um, and Bill, Angela, May, um, uh, Michelle, anybody that knows about this mechanism, feel free to comment on how these things work. So the IDIQ is the umbrella contract and ICHD. So what it is, is it allows you to be in a pool that you can compete for specific task orders, which are the individual pilot studies for a specific condition. So with this first IDIQ contract, they released their first task order with this, which is the task order for NPS2. Um, I read, I saw the contract and it's a long, RFP, so I didn't read through the whole thing, so that's why I missed that surprise that MPS2 is the first task order. But um, yeah, so MPS2 is is one of the tasks under under this umbrella contract, if that makes sense. So NICHD in the, this six year period will release individual task orders for specific condition um, of a pilot study. Uh, do you guys have? Did I? Does that make sense? And does anybody have anything else to add on how this funding mechanism works? Yeah, IDIQ is basically a big, big uh, paperwork requirement to say you have the capacity uh, to do this. You're following all of the privacy and uh, data security rules and la da 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 that you that you got to do in order to have a federal contract. Um, it, it, unless this one's changed, it didn't come with any real money. So it's, it's just paperwork and uh, getting it signed off on. And then, uh, and then you're able to do task orders. The task order is what takes a lot of the time getting the budgets put together and the science put together and as much data as you can gather from the literature and other folks that who might be doing it around the world. And then can you comment more um on why the MPS2 is going to be complex for the state of Georgia? Well, it, it's, it's, it's complex. I mean, Trisha's talking about the laboratory component that, uh, that the, the current ones are part of a kit posed to a, um, a, a laboratory uh, design test, an LDT, and um, we'd have to uh, turn this kit into uh, basically an LDT, which requires revalidation of the kit in the lab. So that's a bunch of work um, to add another enzyme onto this. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's doable. It's just going to take some time and some money to do it. But, um, you know, we have to come up with a budget. We have to figure out how we're exactly we're going to do this and that you can't turn around on a dime. We just, we don't know what's coming. So we can't think about these things ahead of time and plan for them. The task order just lands on our desk and, and they usually want about a month turnaround time. And we always <laughs> plead for an extension because it's just impossible to, to do all of the, um, the, the legwork necessary, let alone get it through the state committee. Um, I just wanted to point out to everybody, I put in the chat window, so the MPS2 nomination will be voted on whether to move it to full evidence review next week on uh, Thursday during the advisory committee's meeting.
Thanks, Amy. And thanks for ex the explanation, the further explanation on the, um, the complexity of the contract and the task order too. Does anybody else have any comments that they want to add? Do we know if there's going to be a technical webinar um, for this, for the IDIQ contract? I didn't have time to look through the entire task order. I haven't today. heard anything. I've been, I printed this today and I've been trying to read as much as I can. I don't see anything about a webinar in there. I also didn't see the, some of you saw that, applying for the task orders was required. I didn't see that either. There are technically two task orders associated with it because there's the IDIQ piece, which does not have funding attached to it, but there is, there's task order A, which is actually, um, gives a small amount of money essentially for somebody like Bill to participate in um, being an expert advisor to these programs. Um, so there, there's that task order, which I could see being required as part of the IDIQ, um, but I didn't see the part where it said requiring to apply for the MPS2 task order. But again, there are 172 pages, so. <laughs> that part I think is close to the end or something that mentions MPS2 is near the end. Yeah, yeah, all the all the amendments or attachments rather are uh, at the end that go through the task order. But I mean, I really yeah. like to see some other states get get in this because um, there's just not that many that are that are doing these, and and we need more. It's a, it's unfortunate that this came out with such a short timeline when there's really a lot that's involved in in putting these in. So my understanding currently, do you have a three, right? The, the first uh, six years, Georgia and uh, um, RTI and the who else? Oh, I think Massachusetts. Right? And Massachusetts, yeah. yep. Yeah. yeah. But this time they're going to fund five. Yeah, the last round two, they set up to five as well. And they have oh, I see. three, okay. so it's the same. Um, maybe we can move to new steps update. Just to sure. Um, Kishi, are you on, are you on the call? Yes. Yeah, um, can you see this? I, I got the. I think I got the slide. Yes, yes, that's the right one. Um, so we have several meetings coming up. Um, so for the first meeting, um, we're hosting a continuous quality improvement um, meeting. The first session of that meeting um, starts on May 25th. Um, so the purpose of this meeting is to convene newborn screening professionals to discuss ways to continually improve newborn screening systems. Um, so registration is open to all who want to attend. And if you do want to register, um, Chanel just put a link in the um, chat box. Um, so we're also hosting um, the New Disorders and Short-Term Follow-Up Virtual Meeting um, on August 25th and 26th. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to provide training and ideas to support newborn screening programs and improving efficiency, increasing knowledge, and expanding capacity. Um, so when I say new disorders for this meeting, we're not just focusing on the ones that were recently added. We're also going to discuss um, disorders that are up on the horizon as well. So we are going to talk about MPS2 and GAMT and CRABA and other conditions. Um, so if you would like to attend that meeting, um, registration will be open in June. Um, so we're also hosting the um, virtual symposium. Um, that will be held between October the 5th um, to the 21st. Um, registration will open for that in June as well. And then the final update um, for the data repository. Um, so the next data entry timeline is June 14th. And this is for um, 2019 confirmed uh, non-time critical case data. Um, so if you guys could update that um, by June 14th, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Kashia. Does anybody have any questions for, for her about all the, um, the meetings that are coming up? And thank you for putting everything in the chat.
Well, thanks again, everybody, for um, joining this month's call. Um, just if you guys have not, please visit mbstrn.org and register to be a part of the website. We'll send you um, updates via email and you'll have access to the MBSTRN tools. You can also follow us on social media accounts, which we have pretty much most of them. Um, feel free, our next meeting will be on June 3rd. Um, if you have any questions or concerns or feedback about this meeting, please um, email myself or Amy Brower. And again, if you have a colleague that has missed the meeting, you can always send them to the YouTube channel. Thanks again, everyone, and see you next month. Um, Jennifer, did you want to mention about the network meeting or maybe you already did? Oh, I did that at the beginning of the call. <laughs> oh, thank you. I probably missed it. Good deal. And, yeah. And Jennifer, um, last month, there was a, a comment that, uh, there, that I think it was the CDC was working on some guidelines for common resolution of VUs. Uh, and they're, they're, yeah, they're working on a database. I sent them an email. Uh, I just reached out to them um, earlier this week. I'm waiting to hear back from them. Um, to see if they would be interested in doing a presentation on their um, database that they're developing so um, states can report their VUSs to them. So I'll let you know if I hear back and maybe they'll be on that upcoming call. But okay, I, awesome. thanks, yeah. And happy to be looped in on any of that kind of discussion with you. Oh, no problem. Any other updates from anybody else? Alrighty, well, thanks again for joining this month and I'll see you guys next month.